Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Planescape Torment with me, Bring It Dawn. Uh, so we're back in like the main area, the first area. I want to show you all something. I can kill the, uh, the Abishais now. Done. I tried it off camera and it worked. What's up? Epoxy bastard. All right, and here we go. It's not working on this, damn it. Well. I mean, now it's not working. Last time I was just hitting him for like 18 and 10. Well, that's a little bit. Yeah, we're just getting slaughtered this time. Come on, get him. There we go. He's worth a ton of experience. And he dropped a quad charm, which is really good. It went a lot smoother off camera, <laughs> so maybe we won't be doing that again anytime soon. I'm gonna go rest up, heal up Mort here. I think he also leveled up. At least he did, yeah. At least he did last time. So plus one fist, uh, saving throws improved, fighting skills improved. Ten hit points gained, two hit points gained from the constitution bonus. All right. Yeah, there we go, now he has 50 health. Now, something I do want to make sure I do is before I hit level 7, is to turn into a mage. Uh, because there are two... I don't want to say checkpoints. Two, um... Basically, at level 7 and level 12, you get a bonus. But you can only get it for one class. Uh, so once you get level 7, depending on your class, you get like plus 1 intelligence if you're a mage, uh, plus plus 1 strength if you're a warrior, plus 1 whatever, probably dexterity if you're a thief, I don't know off the top of my head. And then once you get level 12, you get another bonus, but you have to be the same class to get the uh, specialization, that's what it's called. I forgot it's like double specialization or something if you do both. All right. If you get both of the, uh, le if you get both levels, both those like checkpoints, I don't, again, uh, there's a better word for it, but both those checkpoints with the same class. And we're going here because we have that box for Kuatra, Kuatre. So I go turn that in real quick. Done. All right, let's go talk to him. Moving from box to box, this man seems to be totally immersed in counting boxes and scribbling results down on a piece of parchment. He looks annoyed as you interrupt him. What is it now? Can't you see I'm busy taking inventory? Go bother someone else. I was told to deliver this box to you. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Let's see what you got for me. I'm sure it'll need to be inventoried. Uh, Mara told me to give this to you. As you hold the box out for him to take, Kuitra's expression turns from one of interest to that of intense horror. No, please, get it away from me. I don't understand. Why are you afraid of this box? I said, get back. Death. Evil. Had to dupe Mar. Couldn't take it anymore. Please, take to Braskin. Live southwest. Hive. Me. No. Apparently the side of the box is just too much for him as he runs screaming from the building. Wait, what am I supposed to do with... Updated my journal. I'm gone. Alright, so before I do anything else, I think I want to go to the Smoldering Corpse Bar because I'm pretty sure that's where a mage trainer is. But first, maybe I could talk to the Black Abishai and see if I can. Nah, mm, yeah, let's, let's see if I can aggra aggravate this guy. Oh, here we go. This is a different thing than I took last time. The creature speaks in a rasping hiss. Its voice sounds like two rough stones being scraped together. It hisses for a few moments, its gravelly voice rising and falling. Uh, what? The creature snarls. Nothing to say to you, do I. The fiend's eyes narrow to slits. If stay, your, your warm blood will cover the stones. 
I just want to ask you some questions. The creature roars and then launches itself at you. All right, let's uh, get All back. Right, what? What's up, Chief? I'm gonna keep using the hammer. Oh wow, it's hit for 22 damage. So more doesn't seem to be able to do any damage to it, but I can with my... Amazing hammer skill, yeah, 7,000 experience is nothing to shake a stick at, so... Actually, how close am I to leveling up? Well, I could kill another Abishai and I'll level up. Alright, so this should be the Smoldering Corpse Bar. I'm gone. Just doing once around, see how many people there are to talk to. See, Mot, Okai, Tegarin. Okay, there's a couple of the Abishais here. Ignis, Drusilla. Ignis, by the way, is a recruitable companion. But I think you have to meet uh, certain criteria. Don't quote me on that. Mercy Killers. There's actually a Mercy Killer companion later in the game as well. Oops, didn't mean to click on that. Uh, you see someone dressed as a female dustman with a half-empty glass in her right hand. As you near her, she calls out to you. Um, you. Over here. Uh, you notice that there's something wrong about her, and your exposure to the dustman le leads you to believe that she's just too lively to be a real member of the faction. Uh, approach her. Hey, Cutter. Buy a lady a drink? Oh, you're not really a dustman, are you? She looks around nervously and seems to sober right up. Why, um, why do you say that? Because you don't act like a Dusty, and you're not offering contracts. In fact, you're taking money instead of giving it out for that corpse labor they do at the mortuary. She stifles a squeak of terror and hastens to explain. No, no. No, no, no. I'm not a Dustman. I just found these robes in the street, and I didn't have enough money to get good clothes. And I, uh, heard there was a Dustman thief around. But you could probably find him somewhere else in the southwest part of the hive. I saw him, but I hid from him. Please don't hurt me. I'm not planning on it. Y'all know that you're not pulling it off too well. I answer some questions. What, um, do you want to know? Who are you? Me? I'm Okai. I just like to, um, drink here, and, um, she loses her train of thought momentarily. I'm just a person, you know? Alright, some more questions. Uh, what is this place? Smoldering Corpse Tavern. Can't you read? You're more bub than I am. Oh, I read that wrong. <laughs> Forget it. Alright, something else. Tell me about the other patrons here. Don't know. They're just, um, people. I don't deal much with people. Unless they're buying me a drink. She looks at you hopefully. Alright, uh, who's the burning corpse? He's, um, not a corpse. He's, um, some crazy wizard. Ask around. They'll tell you the story. Alright, farewell. I'm gone. So let me talk to Ignis. Oh! I didn't know he was in here. He is also a companion. Uh, let's talk to Drusilla first. This is a woman with fading bruises on her face and arms and a look of a... Alright, let me restart. This is a woman with fading bruises on her face and arms and a look of despairing longing in her sunken eyes. She might have been pretty once, but those days were long, long ago. She turns slowly to face you. Life pours into her features and the spark of sardonic light that dances in her eyes now makes you wonder if your eyes were deceiving you. Welcome to the smoldering corpse, scarred man. Uh, who are you? I? I am Drusilla. Yeah, Drusilla. And if you must, and you must be clueless. Don't ask me how I know that. It just shines off you. Clueless? I think not. She smirks at you, and her bruises seem almost to fade. Whatever you say, dearie. Is she a succubus? I don't know. Whatever. All right, let's answer some questions. Hi, right, traveler. What is it you seek? What can you tell me about this place? Here. This is a smoldering corpse. Though the person smoldering ain't dead yet. He's, he's just keeping himself alive till someone comes along to help him out. Sods who like to see people in pain come here. Fiends like it. Folks who don't much care for being bothered come here too. The name alone keeps out most of, most of the Burks. But who is he anyway? Updated my journal. That despair you saw on her face before flits across it again, like a black winged shadow before she masters herself. Oh, she might be, uh... Never mind, I won't get into it. Uh, that's Ignis, one of the greatest wizards ever to come out of this slummy excuse for a cesspool. They caught him and they opened a channel to the plane of fire through him, and now he's just a doorway for it, giving himself 
keeping himself alive by force of will alone. If someone could douse him for a few moments, it would give him his life back again. But they don't make enough water to do that. Someone should be able to find something. Uh, what's your connection to him? Her voice practically throbs with a, a deep ache. I was Agnes's lover, and he my beloved. We love the flame more than... He loved the flame more than me, and now he's become the flame. And because I love him, I love the flame. But that's all done with now. Now I wait for him to douse himself. I sell what little I have just so I can be near him. Alright, very well. Uh, what else? Only for a collector by the name of Farod, have you seen or heard of him? Farod? She snickers. The Collector King? You can probably find him and his stinking ilk in the trash warrens on the far side of the hive. Good luck in getting any answers from him. He's a sly devil, he is. Very well. Uh, who's that burning by the entryway? We've already, we know it's Ignis. All right, let's talk to Ignis. This crackling, crackling, billowing creature twists slowly above an iron grill upon the floor of the bar. It may have once been human, but now its skin is charred beyond recognition. Streams of fire form a wreath around the creature's body, and the flames lick at the new remaining pockets of flesh, causing them to bubble and run like wax down the creature's skeletal frame. Examine the smoldering corpse. The heat surrounding this creature is incredible. To your surprise, the iron grill the creature floats above is sagged and bent from the heat. At first you thought the heat came from the grill, but now you realize it emanates from the creature. As you watch, flecks of ash drift from the writhing corpse, a writhing corpse, and float away to the ceiling. Greetings. The thing makes no response. It rises slowly within the flames. It lives, but does not seem aware of anything other than the fire that surrounds it. Its skin, its skin is flame, its heart is flame, and you know within some shattered corner of your memory that this, that, that this thing is dangerous. Yeah, so there is a quest you can do, and you can All recruit right. him into your party. I'm going to save uh, Dakon here for last. Let's talk to Ebb Creeknees. Or Candrian. See a soft looking man with gentle, far staring eyes. He dresses in supple leather clothing and carries various implements of use and destruction about his body, such as ropes, spikes, tinder boxes, and empty vials of air. He looks half gone, literally. There's an insub insubstantiality to his existence, as if his essence has been had been partially leached away. He focuses those eyes on you, and suddenly you find them gripping and determined. Greetings to you, O Seeker. Uh, greetings. He carefully sets down the mug he's holding and gives you all his attention. I have seen the far reaches of the multiverse and returned to tell the tale. I have walked upon the bodies of dead gods and spun moonbeams in the astral ahead of a thousand shrieking Githyanki knights. I have passed the edges of existence and watched my essence shiver away before me. What is it I can do for you? Well, that's one heck of a greeting. I had some questions for you. Perhaps I have answers for you. Speak and I shall tell you. Oh, I can use him for Ingress. Alright, who are you? I am Kandarian Ilborn, traveler, dreamer, tailspinner, and so forth. You're a traveler? Tell me of the plains. I am tired, Seeker. So tired. I am fresh back from negation. I'll answer what I can for you, but I cannot promise that you will find satisfaction in the answers I give. What would you know? Would you hear of the outer plains, the prime material, or the inner plains? Uh, what's the difference? Oh boy. Alright. <laughs> the difference is true essence, Seeker. The inner planes are a matter of substance, true physicality. They are the building blocks of the multiverse, for it is from them that all belief in the elements springs. The inner planes filter through the ethereal plane, the plane of potential, some say, which forms the elements into the worlds of mortals. Once past the ethereal plane, one reaches the prime material, where exists all manner of mortals and monsters and myths and machines. It is there, the be it is there that belief is born, and there that the spirits that create the outer planes are born. When mortals die, they pass through the astral plane, a no place that is thought and mental energy itself. Yeah, I read that right. Alright. It is in all things and in none. It is paradox, among other things, and it filters spirits into the Great Ring. Do you comprehend so far? One moment. Alright, yes, go on. Alright, now the outer planes. Where should I start? Do you know the cardinal rules of the planes on which all others are based? Do you know about the composition of the outer planes? Do you know of the great ring and its divisions in our hearts? Do you know of the individual planes? Each of these leads to the next, and so it is best to start from the beginning. Alright, tell me of the composition of the planes. The outer planes are created of and by belief and thought and faith. 
They take their imagined form from the prime material plane, shaped into forms that stagger the imagination, built by the accumulation of belief. Belief creates the planes. Belief is power here. Change belief, and you can change the nature of reality. The creatures that are born here, the plane born, like the fiends and celestials, are truly born of the thoughts and concepts of mortals. They each express some sort of ideal, and the more powerful the ideal, the more powerful the being. Thus, the being that symbolizes love is one of the strongest of all. Go on. That's why the powers, gods some call them, live out here. This is where all the faith in them comes, and this is where they are at their most pure and most strong. The realms are extensions of their very beings, manifestations of their godly essence, all of it informed by belief. So the composition of the planes is belief. Tell me of the great ring now. <sighs> Among the loose unity of planeswalker, plane walkers, we conceive of the infinite outer planes as a ring surrounding the plane of ultimate neutrality, the outlands. The spire atop which Sigil sits is the center of the outlands. The further one travels away from the spire, the less neutral the plane grows until it spills out, spills into the neighboring planes. Each of these planes impinges on the outlands, spinning themselves into law and chaos, good and evil. The Great Road marks a demarcation between the outlands and the gate towns that spring up around the gates of these plains. Beyond the gate town lies the hinterlands, uncharted territory that is lost to history, that loses thought. Uh, danger lies in, in the hinterlands. The outer plains differ by mortality, not substance. For you, we will divide the plains into three sets. The upper plains of good, the lower plains of evil, and the boundary plains of neutrality. These are then divided further by law and chaos within the outlands in the middle. Yeah, alright, which of these interests you? Oh my goodness. The Upper Plains. Of the Upper Plains, there are the Neutral Plains, the Lawful Plains, and the Chaotic Plains. What would you know? Holy, so much. The Neutral Plains. The Neutral Upper Plains contain the Beastlands, a place of neutrality and goodness with a slight tinge of chaos, where the animals rule in the eternal noon and night. They hold Bitopia, twin paradise of industry and labor, where all work toward toward the good of all, and Elysium, the sweetest plane of goodness and calm I have ever come across. Alas, right now I am not well enough to enjoy any of their restorative effects. What would you hear now? Hear of now? Uh, upper Plains? Lawful Plains. Kandrian gives a small shudder. I'm not the best person to speak of the Plains of Law, he says. For the innate structure of... For the innate structure and ultimate patterns they impose frighten me. I steer clear of them, because I value my individuality more than I value the knowledge they'll bring me. They include Regimented Arcadia, nearest of the good planes to the unbending order of Mechanus, and Mount Celestia, home of the Archons, an island in the Silver Sea. Uh, chaotic Plains. These are where I feel at home, though I steer clear of Isgard for the most part. The endless battles and tests of metal among the floating earthbergs of the plain don't do much for my disposition. Arborea, though, he sighs. The mountains are taller, the air is clearer, the river is purer, and the game larger than anywhere else. It is a true paradise, a place where passions run high and the wine never ceases to flow. When I have recovered enough of my wits and myself, when we have done when we have done with the outer plains, you should ask me of the inner, and I will describe my journey to you. I will return to Arborea's bowers and glades and lose myself for a time. Okay, uh, I guess now the inner plains? He sighs, as if this reminded him of his bone-deep weariness. Think of the inner planes as a globe. On, on the top pole, you have the positive material plane. On the bottom, you have the negative material. He pauses. Remind me to tell you of the negative. His eyes turn inward to some private horror. Uh, from the interaction between the two springs, all of the urge, all of the urge for existence and non-existence, death and life, actuality and nothing. From them spring the basic elemental planes, like fire, water, air, and earth. The para-elemental planes that lie between the four basic pla elements and the quasi-elemental planes that come from the interaction of the four elements with the positive and the negative. Alright, tell me of the negative material plane. His eyes cloud over. I went to the inner planes to discover my true essence. I made the mistake of visiting the negative material plane in order to understand my body's urge to decay and the cycle of death and life. I thought myself protected against the ill effects of the plane with my magic, but I was wrong. The blackness of infinite nothing pressed on my soul, and I was beset by shadows that sought to snuff out my very soul. I lost my way for a time, for an eternity, and nearly lost my existence. I could feel my essence falling away from me, and am even now half gone. Never will I return. How did you survive? Updated my journal. How did I survive? He smiles tightly. With a piece of nothing that held back the nothing. Nothing can stop nothing, you know, and so I carried nothing in my hand to protect me. 
Do you plan to journey to the ultimate negation yourself? You have the smell of desperation about you, and so I make this make you this gift. Hold it in your hand when the shadows press in, and it should protect you and your friends somewhat, should they remain close to you. Heh. <laughs> he passes you a small black token that looks as if it has no dimensionality to it at all. Thanks, tell me the Oh. Alright, uh I've already done this. Tell me the planes. Inner planes, we already talked about that. How did you survive? More of the planes. Alright, here we go. The prime material. Uh, you want to know you want to know of the prime, visit it. The boundless worlds of that plane have an infinite variety, as do the planes, but I cannot encapsulate them as I have here. Suffice it to say, they are, they are the birth of the outer planes, the children of the inner, and they hold limitless potential within their boundaries. More of the planes. Um, what did you mean when you mentioned negation before? All right, we already did that. And other questions. Uh, what are you doing? I am fresh back from negation, and I'm trying to restore my essence before it slips away from me altogether. Negation? What do you mean? All right, we've already talked about that. Uh, what is this place? Unless the cosmos has shifted or we have been spun into the mazes, I would say that we're in the Smoldering Corpse Tavern. Uh, what can you tell me of the patrons here? I mind my own business here, Seeker, for I spend too much time away not minding it. Speak to the bartender if you would learn more of the customers. Of his customers. Which is over there. Okay. Do you know a collector named Farod? Farod grew up to be a collector. How long ago was this? When I set out last, he was but a vicious stripling in one of the upper wards. Heh. <laughs> Time does change some people. No, Seeker. I don't know Farod anymore. I'm willing to bet. Okay. Uh, I met a woman named Ingress with very bad teeth. She said she had come through a portal from some world that opened by a tune hummed near two cross trees. Can you get her home? He pauses briefly thinking. I know the portal of which you speak, though I have not traveled it in these... In thir oh my goodness. Though I have not traveled it these 30 years gone. I'll take her home, Seeker. Go tell her to await my arrival, then meet me back here. I will tell you if I, I was successful or not. Thanks. Farewell. Updated my journal. Holy crap, Roly. That was a lot. Alright, let's talk to Ebb Creekneys. You see a slightly stooped old man with a full gray beard and a lion's mane of gray hair. He wears a couple of shoulder guards as armor, and he keeps a helmet nearby. He smokes a pipe and carries a pouch of tobacco around his waist. He looks pretty strong, but he's a little plump and also appears to have some sort of breathing trouble. Well now, aren't you a sight, lad? Never have I seen so many scars blanketing a fella. Like a scar cloak you're wearing. Where you been, hanging out in the grain thresher? He laughs. I'm just jesting with you, lad. No offense meant, and I hope no offense taken. I'm Eb. He extends his hand. Greetings, Eb. His handshake is firm. Now hereby tender my apologies for the unfair jesting, lad. Hope no hard feelings. Can I buy you a tankard or two of something to smooth any ruffled feathers? Why not? That's the spirit, lad. Bide a moment. He rises to his feet and heads to the bar. After a moment, he returns to his seat with a pair of tankards. Here you go, lad. Drink up. He takes a massive swallow from his own tankard, puffs on his pipe, and says, What can old Eb do for you on this fine sigil day? I had some questions about this place. Oh, well, I gathered that just just to look at you. I mean, you don't look like you're from around these parts, lad. You look a little too out of sorts to be a seasoned native. Eb chuckles and takes another drink. So what can I help you with, lad? You need to know the lay of the land? Eb winks. But who are you? Ed Creekneys, third measure of the harmonium, now retired and being a tout with one's voice since I didn't step as lightly as I might these past two or three decades. He chuckles. Now, lad, uh, who be you and what trouble might you be in? Uh, third measure of the harmonium. Ed puffs up slightly in pride and gets a semi-stern look on his face. Aye, third measure of the harmonium. He relaxes a little. Though I haven't served a tour of duty in many a decade. Pushing a quill wasn't quite up my alley after all the fights and skirmishes I, I've been in, so I just bide my time keeping tabs on things down here in the hive, and helping out a little where I can. And you look like someone who might need a hand. Are you in some kind of trouble, lad? Or what fights and skirmishes have you been in? Ab rolls his eyes. More than I can remember, lad. Well, almost more than I can remember, leastwise. I did an all-too-long tour in the Blood Roar, the infernal muck-up war of lies on Terra's uh, far too many years in the Black Centuries War. Ed begins to take off the wars on his fingers and counts silently to himself. Yeah, then there was the Three Plains War, and many others. Ava took part in the Harmonium War of Liberation. 
Oh, towards the end there, I was also in the Sigil City Watch. Some could argue that was the most dangerous of them all. He laughs loudly. The mention of the Blood War feels like a cold dagger slipping into your heart. Hmm. Tell me more of the Blood War. Epp sighs, oblivious to your reaction. Aye, uh, the Blood War. The most dangerous family feud this side of the primordial soup. A mean-spirited mob of fiends on one side, a batch of warmonger fiends on the other. It's the war that created... They... It's the war that creation sparked, and they've been digging into each other ever since. Two sets of fiends warring against each other. Aye. The Tenari, vicious killers who care for none but themselves, and the Batezu, war machine. Uh, all for law and order under their infernal rules. The whole mess spills out into, into other planes from time to time. It's made the multiverse a less pleasant place to live. Uh, what is this place? You're in the Smoldering Corpse Bar, lad. Not a pretty place as some, but it's got its own homespun kind of charm. Uh, let's go to drink here. Well, not to say I've got some beta raw discrimination when it comes to it comes to drink, but I've got drinks I'm partial to, and some vintages to which I'm not. Actually, one of my favorite little things to get here is some Arborean fire seeds. You swill them in your mouth, add a little air and some spit and some alcohol, and you can breathe a little fire when you need to. Leastways, that's how it feels. Uh, tell me about the patrons here. Well, you got O, who claims to be a letter stead of a person. Some mercy killers waiting around for a criminal. A pair of Abash Abishai on furlough from the Blood Roar. Blood War. A Gvzari over there who's been watching you from afar. Not too unusual, mind you. They're Piri Cutters. And Elias down there, a clueless kid whose britches seem to be, just, to be just a bit too tight, if you get my meaning. If you're wanting information on the planes, talk to Kandrian Ilborn over there. He knows more than most I know. And who's a smoldering corpse? Him? Oh, no corpse, lad. No dead or him. Near as we can tell, old Ignis is still alive inside that little roast pit. Near as we can figure, anyway. Ev wrinkles his nose. He can smell damnably awful sometimes, too. Keeps me on the pipe to make sure it, it don't warm its way into my nose, it does. He chuckles. How did he get there? Ev takes a smoke from his pipe for a moment, as if deciding how to phrase his comment. Well now, lad... Ignis had a smattering of problems and some not slight wizardry magics to boot, and seldom do the two mix well, if you understand me. He liked to... Ed puffs on his pipes and smoke trails up. Well, he liked to burn things, and he started torching places and people, and generally making a bunch of trouble. And? Well, now most of this was going on in the Hive, and I'll be the first to admit that the Hive is not the first place the Harmonium goes to keep Sigil's Law. Ed looks like... Ed looks a little shamefaced. A failing on our part, since it may have been the place where our presence is most needed. So by the ladies' reckoning, there was little street-side justice in the wizard, wizardly community. A bunch of tea-leaf readers, hedge wizards, and midwife witches got together and managed to weave a spell that was kind of poetic justice. Ebb gestures with his pipe at the figure. So now he sits there and burns. He's still alive, which I don't think they, which I don't think they counted on. Okay. Uh, tell me of Sigil and its environs. Eb laughs loudly. Uh, you don't think small, do you? If you want to know what's outside the city, go talk to Kendarian Ilborn over there. He's the traveler of this place. As for the rest of it, well, I can tell you of the lady. The Dabas, the keys, and portals. The way the way we keep track of time. The way the city's laid out. What was it you wanted to know? <sighs> How long have I been recording? My throat's taking a beating. Uh, tell me of the lady. Well, well, now, not many know much about her, lad. And I'm figuring even those that know more than a little don't know too much more. She's a mystery, she is. And even should you run across her, powers forbid. She's silent and deadly. She's not evil, far as, far as I can tell. But she keeps the dark about herself and sigil pretty tight. None's been able to penetrate it. And if they have, they've been, they've been mazed. Uh, go on. Chances are you won't meet, meet her unless you do something really bad. Hurting a lot of people, killing a Davis, challenging her rule, worshipping her, she hates that we figure, or interfering with the Davis's work, which may as well be the lady's work. If you're lucky, just the, just the mercy killers will come for you, but if she comes, you'll be dead as soon as her shadow falls on you. Hey, what did you mean when you said mazed? Because I was mazed. Oh man. Aye, right, sometimes bloods will be packed off to a place where they can't do no harm. The lady see, she'll take a bit of sigil and make a little dimensional pocket out of it, a maze. She places those that have crossed her in there and lets them rot. Ed puffs his pipe. Now, you can't escape getting mazed. 
uh, once, the lady sets her gaze on you, lad. She'll, she'll get you eventually, no matter how hard you try and dodge her. You'll be walking down an alley, or about to step through a portal, or take a left turn down a street you've gone uh, many full times before, and suddenly you're someplace you don't recognize. Now mazes aren't escape proof. There's always a way out of each one. A portal the lady places there. You just have to figure out where it is and how to use it. Alright, uh, tell me of the Davis. I don't really care about the Davis. Ah, uh, may as well. Alright, those funny floating bloods that speak in symbols? Eb laughs. Quite a piece of work, huh? The Davis are kind of the lady's janitors and workmen, doing exactly what she wants. Uh, make sure sigils running up to snuff, patching walls, tearing down old buildings, building new ones, setting up portals, sealing off others, and on and on. They're a pretty neutral faring bunch, and you don't want to interfere with one or kill one, or you'll bring the lady's wrath down on you quite right quick. Alright, one moment, I gotta see how long I've been recording. Oh man, alright. Now tell me of Sigil's time. The way we measure time in Sigil's by the brightness of the sky. See, we haven't got a sun and moon like most worlds. We just got this everlasting haze that brightens and darkens at regular cycles. What most folks call midnight, we call anti-peak. What they call noon, we call peak. See, it's based on the peak and anti-peak of the brightness. So when someone says something about five hours past peak, that's what they mean. Okay. Now tell me about the city's layout. Ooh, let me wet my tongue. He takes a pull from his tankard. The city floats above an infinitely tall spire, the spire. It lies on its side like a discarded wagon wheel, but there's no spokes that connect it to the spire. It's divided into six wards, each of them with its own function. Right now you're in the hive. I think the purpose of the hive is to be squalor to the rest of the city's grandeur. He laughs. Factions, philosophical clubs, or gangs if you prefer, divide up the running of the city between them. Were you in a faction? Ed raises his hand as if to stop you and laughs slightly. Oh, now hold on, lad. I'm no has-been faction member. They, they say, and they're right, that once you're one of the Harmonium, you're a Harmonium for life. Were the bloods that try and make the sigil stay... Were the bloods that try and make sure sigil stays out of trouble. No rock in the spire, no folks getting too over-enthusiastic about hurting each other, keeping the city down to a low roar. We try to keep the peace, lad, and most times we do a decent job. Alright, tell me of keys and portals. This is called the City of Doors for a reason, lad. There's portals everywhere. Portals are, well, like doors that lead across the multiverse, except they don't look like doors. Instead, they can be bound, they can be any bounded space, window, door, pothole, picture frame, barrel hoop, the spaces inside scaffolding, a wardrobe. It should be a portal waiting for just the right key to open it and take you someplace in the multiverse. Now, keys. Go on. Ah, each portal has a key you need to open it. Now, while portals can be any bounded space, keys have more variety. They can be anything from a little tune you hum to the next, uh, when the next, ugh, when next to the portal, to dancing a jig, to being in the right mood, to having a piece of the place you want to go to, you want to go in your hand, and on and on. In my youth, I once convinced a girl that hissing a, kissing a man beside it would open a portal to Arcadia. Turned out I was right, and many trips to Arcadia did we have. <laughs> many portals probably have never been found. There's some you can uncover just by asking people and getting the right key. Finding out the dark of a portal is the toughest part. But I warn you, lad. Portal hopping shouldn't be a pastime for a fella in your way. Nor should you be wandering sigil after dark, neither. You do best to stick to the main ways and open peak and watch yourself. Okay, you know what? We have a little bit of time. I'm gonna go and turn in the quest to, uh... Well, hold on, that's my... Yeah, let's go talk to Ingress real quick. We'll do this quest and then we'll call it an episode. Cause that's, I'm gone. Whew, that's a lot of reading. Tough stuff. All right. But the writing is really good in the game. I'm having fun reading it. The only downside is when it's written in their accent and I. Whew. Too many apostrophes. Now, Ingress was in here somewhere, right? There she is. You see Ingress. She's huddled inside her cloak of dirty rags, her teeth chattering. She's glancing furtively about her as if expecting to be attacked at any moment. Like, greetings, Ingress. Hey, you. She squints at you. What is it you want me now? One of me now. Want, want me to leave, not leaving the city? Okay, we've already read all that. Ingress, I found someone who can take you back to your home plane. Ingress falls salad. I want to go. 
want to leave this place. His name is Candrian. He should be along shortly to help you. Trust him, alright? Ingress says nothing, really nods quietly, her teeth chattering inside her mouth. I'll go back and meet Candrian at the Smoldering Corpse Bar and make sure everything turned out alright. Be strong, Ingress. Alright, let's go back to and talk to Candrian. We'll finish up this quest and then we'll call it an episode. That way I actually get something done besides just a ton of reading. Well, I guess I did do the one quest. I uh, tried to give that guy his box. He did not want it. Alright. Oh crap! That must be the alleyway. Alright, let's kill these guys real quick. Let's actually hang out here. Lure him out here so I can actually fight him. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm gone. Mort, not sure why not. You gotta face only a sledgehammer to come up. And hand. All right. Well, this has turned into a full-on street brawl. But I'm fine with. I'm no problem killing a bunch of uh, thugs. All right, Mort. Track him down. You father. Of No running now. You're committed to this course of action. Hive bug. Huh? Sure, why not? I'm gone. What? Good is done. Alright. I'm gone. Hi, Kendra stands as you approach him. The Tooth Woman wanted you to have these, he says, holding out his hand. She wanted to express her thanks, even out of the balance book as it even out the balance book as it were, and be done with the darn things. In the palm of his hand are Ingress's dancing teeth, and he smoothly deposits them into your hand. Enjoy them, Seeker. Updated my journal, so I have to drop it. What's up, Chief? Okay. You pick him up. I never examined this ornate box. I could use it. It appears to be a small wooden box, intricate designs etched in gold adorn the box. At one time this box would have been worthy enough to be displayed at any aristocrat's estate. However, years of neglect have taken their toll and it appears to be falling apart. If not for the large ruby mounted in the front of the box, it would be worthless. That's the negative token, I was told of. Ingress's teeth. Okay, I can equip it to Mort. It's a handful of Ingress's living teeth. Apparently they didn't want to go back, go with her back through the portal to her home plane. They rattle amongst themselves whenever they are held close together. They remind you of a bunch of creepy ivory hopping bugs. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, you examine Ingress's teeth. You can't shake their resemblance to ivory bugs. You get the feeling that they were looking at you expectantly, awaiting some command. Oh, look at this! I'll become a magical weapon. The teeth rattle about wildly, then suddenly settle down. After a brief moment, they begin to emit a soft, magical glow. Hey, come on. Hey, come on. Hey. 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 Hey, come on. Hey, 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 come on. Hey, 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 come on. <laughs> okay. What's the word, Chief? So I can... Can I use it whenever? So I can change it to piercing. The teeth elongate to sharp fangs. Oh. Do crushing damage. Oh, so they, they just straight up upgraded. Well, let's do piercing and magic. So it's a magic weapon, and now it's also piercing damage. All right, I'm going to call it here. In the next episode, we'll get to meet and greet with more of the uh, patrons in the Smoldering Corpse Bar. There's going to be a lot more talking. This might actually take a couple more episodes, so uh, saddle up, everybody. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope to see you all in the next episode. <laughs>